Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our panel discussion. It's a pleasure to have all of you here as part of Circular City Week, where we have the um, <clears throat> beautiful opportunity to share knowledge and best practices to accelerate the transition to a more circular economy. Um, today's event is the final of three events this week that are specifically examining circularity in the furniture field. On Monday, we looked at how business strategy in the furniture industry can shape and promote circular practices. Yesterday, we looked at um, circularity in the furniture industry through the lens of public policy. But today, we're specifically looking at a crucial but often overlooked element in reaching circularity, which is design. Um, it, circularity is really almost impossible to achieve without implementing design practices that allow um, circularity to happen. So we'll be asking things like, what is the role of design in reaching circularity? How do we implement design with circularity in mind? How do specific techniques like life cycle audits, design for disassembly, reclaiming technical and biological nutrients, create opportunities and hurdles? And maybe what do those terms even mean if you're not familiar with them? Um, of course, we'll be looking at some real case studies that exemplify and highlight these techniques. Um, looking at the challenges that they create, the solutions to overcoming them, and of course, where do we even begin with all of this? This series today, um, or this whole three-part series on furniture and circularity, is brought to you by collaborative effort of MEBEL, Transforming Furniture, which is a committed to bold system change towards circularity in the furniture industry by creating educational content and interactive exhibits developing information resources, and facilitating cross-sector collaborations. Uh, the Sustainable Furnishings Council, which is a coalition of manufacturers, retailers, and designers dedicated to raising awareness and expanding the adoption of environmentally sustainable practices across the home furnishings industry. And by me, your moderator, Sarah Templin, I'm a product and material designer, a contributing writer on sustainability and product design for Core 77, and a design educator at the Maryland Institute College of Art and Parsons School of Design at the New School. And I'm very happy to be joined by an all-star lineup of thought and action leaders who are working in the furniture sector and can share what they've learned about driving change from within towards greater circularity. Um, Pantilla Padaraposit is the co-founder of Sabai Design, a furniture company with a goal of making sustainable living accessible. Um, she's from Thailand, where she grew up with a deep appreciation of the environment. Pantilla graduated from Columbia University in 2016 with a degree in political science and economics and worked for Morgan Stanley before pivoting to attend uh, NYU School of Law. There she started Sabai with her co-founder, Caitlin, while they were in law school, after they experienced how difficult it can be to live sustainably. After graduating from law school in 2020, she began devoting herself full-time to Sabai and was recognized in 2021 by Inc.'s Female Founders 100. We're also joined by Emily McGarvey, as the Director of Sustainability for Room and Board, Emily brings 20 years of experience spearheading social and environmental strategies with a focus on product, <clears throat> supply chain, operations, and branding. Leading sustainability initiatives for Room and Board and Room and Board Business Interiors, the brand's commercial arm, she's strategically focused on bringing sustainability to the forefront of furniture manufacturing. Prior to her role with Room and Board, Emily served as the Director of Corporate Social Responsibility at Target, where she played an integral role in developing the corporation's sustainability program, ruling out enterprise-wide initiatives, including the chemi 
the company's chemical management and transparency policy and their car seat trade-in program. In 2018, she founded Star Impact Consulting, where she provided purpose-driven strategy and branding for both for-profit and nonprofit business sectors, such as Apparel Impact Institute. And we're joined by Paula Liu, who is a senior product director at Closed Loop Partners, which is an impact investment firm and innovation center focused on the development of the circular economy. Her work focuses on evaluating new technologies, materials, and markets to drive investment towards viable, safe, and circular solutions, and to accelerate their commercialization. To date, she's focused on circularity topics related to textile recycling, chemical recycling, and industrial composting. So while the examples that we have today are gonna to be largely, well, they will be drawn from the furniture industry. I think that all of you um, joining us today will find these strategies very applicable across whatever industry that you might be in. This is also a really wonderful opportunity to learn from um, three different brands who operate at very different scales and maybe with very different outlooks. Um, so before we dive into some of our questions, I also want to point out that we do have um, a Q&A that will begin around 2.40. And we, of course, rec um, uh, welcome your questions. Please put them specifically in the Q&A box um, rather than in the chat box. And if you can, um, load them prior to 12.40 when we begin our, um, our audience Q&A. So, Welcome everybody, all our panelists. I'm just going to um, start with a, a pretty broad question that is open to all of you, which is how does design factor into or relate to circularity for you and your company? So that might mean um, what design techniques do you rely on to meet your circularity goals? Where do you find your biggest hurdles? Of course, I would love some very specific examples from your, your own companies. I'll just open it up to all three of you. Yeah, I'm happy to um, happy to kick it off. Um, so until I think he might be muted still. Oh. I can hear you. I can hear her too. Great. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm happy to hit kick it off. So like Sarah mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of Sabai and our whole mission is around making sustainable living more accessible. And so in terms of sustainability and, you know, designing from the onset for that, for us, that really is necessary. You really have to look at, you know, to be thoroughly sustainable, look at our impact at each and every stage and to actually address that, that comes in at the design phase. And so for us, you know, I think the thing that first comes to mind for a lot of people is just around materials and manufacturing process because that seems that is oftentimes step one and so designing a supply chain that is you know as local and domestic as possible but then also thinking about you know how the product is going to be used and ultimately possibly reused or recycled and so on the materials front we use you know a combination of recycled upcycled non-toxic or natural materials um, I think we actually worked with Sarah in the past to do aud an audit of, of, of our products and continue to do so um, to see where we can incorporate more sustainable materials. And um, tangibly, uh, for example, we used we made the switch to use jute and burlap in our upholstery process um, instead of synthetic materials. I think there are practices that were used previously that can be re-implemented that are, are you know, just as good and utilize materials that are natural. Um, with our coffee tables that were coming out actually in June, we're working with a partner to utilize reclaimed wood um, from fallen trees that would otherwise go to landfills out of Baltimore. So thinking around that on the material side, but also I think if you're thinking about it from a circular standpoint, I think there are a lot of interesting suppliers doing great things on the material side now, but in terms of synthetic and natural materials, also thinking from the onset of, you know, how might those things be separated because for, for example, a lot of blends like fiber blends utilize both natural and synthetic materials. And ultimately, 
you know, you could recycle a synthetic material or you could compost and allow a natural material to biodegrade. But if they're combined, there's not that much, there isn't really a lot of technology to separate the two yet. And so thinking from the design point for that type of question and how, um, how that material might ultimately be thrown away, recycled, et cetera. So um, yeah, that's on the material side. Um, and then on the design of the product itself, we also work to design the product so that they're compatible with programs to either repair the product, revamp the product, um, expand the product so that customers can, um, you know, we've had customers who've had their dog like rip up the arm of a sofa, which uh, you might not think about, but instead of having to replace that whole piece through our program, we've designed it so that you can actually buy a new set of arms from us and replace that and extend the lifespan of your product. And so, you know, that also requires taking that into account from the design phase and that point early on. And so that's kind of how we've, um, one way that we've tried to address that as well. Yeah, your products are all designed to be flat packed for shipping, but that also means that everything is very easily taken apart so that people can exactly. design in a way so that the consumer can take it apart and replace the arm if they need to. Or exactly, and I think uh, the demographic that we kind of speak <laughs> to specifically is tends to be on the younger side and I think can be more susceptible to you know concepts like fast furniture and so allowing for whether it's just wanting to switch parts out to change the aesthetic um, and keep it fresh without having to replace a whole new piece that's another way that's not necessarily repairing something but revamping it or changing it without with um, while limiting the amount of turnover and waste that's generated. Paula, Emily, you have anything to contribute to that overarching ideas? Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what was said. And I think that does, everything starts with design. So how are you designing the product from the beginning? What materials are you choosing? Um, we also use some reclaimed wood, which is fantastic and urban wood as a reclaimed material, which is great to be able to reuse and keep those, keep that carbon sequestered and stored and give it a new life. Um, and so that's a great example of materials. We also have a um, outdoor Adirondack chair that's made out of recycled HDPE. And so that's a, a more recycled plastic material. And then um, that, that product actually is cradle to cradle certified. And so if you're familiar with that certification, that really looks at all of the material environmental health and gives a certification saying that it is a very, very circular product. And so in that regard, certification has helped us in the design process and really to verify um, how circular a product is. And then that Adirondack chair at the end of its life is able to be disassembled and then all the different parts are able to be recycled through industrial recycling or our vendor has a reutilization program that they can take back those materials. And so that works really well as well. So there's kind of the material side of things and then there's the supply chain side of things, kind of that bottom half of the circle. Once consumers and customers are done with a product, how do we collect it? How do we take it back and sort it and disassemble it? and then get it back to that raw material state to be to be looped back in as a raw material. And that I think is a is a big piece of the puzzle that we're starting to figure out pieces of it, but I think that's a great opportunity for partnership throughout the whole industry to really help us figure out how to do that even better. Yeah, and that of course, in order to get to the point where you can even think about applying for that or implementing those systems, you need to be, um, using de design techniques that allow your Adirondack chair to be fully disassembled at the end. You need to be choosing materials that are probably a mono material, or if your fasteners are a separate material, they can be fully removed rather than glued together, for instance, or overshot. Yeah, exactly. Um, for that Adirondack chair, you've got the plastic, you've got the aluminum inserts, and you've got stainless steel fasteners, and that's it. That's the whole product. And so and it, it has all been designed to come apart. And similar, if a if a squirrel or other type of animal were to chew on the arm, maybe a dog too, that can also be taken off and sent back and then just be given the piece to repair it versus having to replace the entire product. Yeah. So it really is um, designing the object in a way so that it can meet the requirements for the certification, but it's also really if you're having trouble, I would say um, convincing your boss of this, if you were a designer, um, it is kind of building in some brand loyalty with your clients because all they have to do is replace this one element instead of the entire thing. 
Absolutely. Um, Emily, I actually would really love to hear more about uh, the room and board experience of using reclaimed and upcycled woods, like the urban wood program that you have and um, how that factors into the design process. Where has that been successful for you and where have you had some challenges? Yeah, absolutely. So the urban wood project, as we call it, mm -hmm. is really about reclaiming um, urban wood. And urban wood comes from basically, um, you know, there's two different ways it comes from. It's either buildings that are being deconstructed or it comes from urban care operations. And so that means that trees are being taken down in cities because of storm damage, safety concerns, disease, canopy management. And so you have these trees coming down in two different ways. And so several years ago, the Forest Service approached room board um, because the city of Baltimore was actually taking down between like 16 and 30,000 homes are actually slated for demolition just in that one city. And so instead of doing demolition, they really wanted to do deconstruction. And they were looking for an outlet for the material to actually be created into new products. And so Room and Board joined the project. Um, and it was really fascinating because there's this yellow pine that is old growth or second growth that really doesn't exist anymore, but it's sitting within these row homes that are coming down. And so the Forest Service connected with us and they also connected with a nonprofit that was creating jobs for people. And so a lot of these people have barriers to employment, whether it's previous incarceration or lack of education, they were given jobs to help with this deconstruction process. And for every one job in a demolition project, there's actually six to eight jobs in a deconstruction project. And so that's keeping thousands of pounds of materials out of landfill. And it's also creating this economic opportunity because it's living wage jobs, it's salary, it's benefits, and it's putting people on a path towards lifelong and sustainable employment. So that side of the social piece, I, I find really important because the deconstruction of these Baltimore row homes are not only creating this raw material to be reclaimed into new into new products, it's also helping people um, as they're on their journey and their career path. And so now all this beautiful yellow pine can be turned into new products and a lot of end tables and coffee tables and things like that. And so the the challenge was really the supply chain on that on that side of things of how do we how do we connect with the, the city and with the nonprofit and with our, our own vendor supply chain, brick and board, who can sort and prep the product for use? And then back to design, now that we have this raw material that's been reclaimed, what do we do with it? What's the best use of it? And how do we use as much of it as possible? Um, and so today, those urban wood projects and those urban wood products are in our room and board stores and you know and they're selling really well and we're having a, a great time with them and we've expanded from baltimore to anaheim sacramento detroit minneapolis and brooklyn and we're continuing to look for even more partners because what it does is it opens up a supply chain of reclaimed wood that we can then um, our designers, who I sit with the designers in, in our office, and they have so much fun looking at what type of material is coming in and then dreaming of these beautiful products that we can put into people's homes. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, Brick and Board, you said, is the name of that company you're working with, right? Yes. Yep, um, they're fantastic. Yeah, they're great. Bali, you've talked about how your role at Closed Loop Partners is um, somewhat to sort of analyze what needs to be true for design activities to fit inside a safe circular future. Can you expand on that a little bit and give some examples of what that looks like for you, what you're looking for? Certainly, yes. Um, so Close Loop <clears throat> Partners is an investment firm and an innovation center, and we're providing capital to change our linear supply chains across sectors to more circular ones. Um, on my side of the house, um, I am focused on, um, as my bio mentioned, um, focused on evaluating new materials and um, taking a comprehensive analytical look of the supply chains and material flows and manufacturing processes to better understand a handful of things. From a design perspective, it's looking at the raw materials themselves. How does the raw material need to change or be adapted in order for that material to cycle through manufacturing and remanufacturing 
um, at its highest goal in perpetuity. Um, so like taking textiles as an example, um, uh, natural fibers tend to shorten every cycle that they're remanufactured. And so what are the innovations that we can invest in to apply to sort of address that uh, design or, or um, challenge? And then from a synthetic material side, you know, there are technologies in the market today, like molecular recycling, some folks call it chemical recycling, that allow us to keep um, plastic polymers or synthetic fibers in circulation, again, in perpetuity, really resetting that molecule. But they exist in very niche pockets around the world. They're not commercialized technologies. And so our team looks at trying to understand the entire value chain from feedstock to materials um, across that entire value chain to understand where investments can be made so that we can commercialize new kinds of supply chains. And, um, you know, interestingly enough, you know, I, I think the challenge around designing for circularity is, is that piece um, or, or is acknowledging that our linear system has been incentivized. Um, either economically because virgin material is a lot cheaper or because we lack the collections and sortation infrastructure, um, as Emily noted, to bring back a lot of the materials that are put in production. And that's true of furniture, just as it's true of nearly every other category of products that we consume. Um, and, and so, really creating these collections and sortation models requires us to create the economic incentives to not send these things to landfill. I'm really excited, um, or personally, I'm really excited about the new kinds of business models and projects and collaborations that this is sort of sparking across um, the furniture industry and elsewhere. Um, and then as investors, you know, we are, uh, um, investing in companies that have resale and reuse and repair models, others that have, you know, those technologies that enable textile recycling, um, and then, and then um, even investing in supply chain technologies that bring that transparency to material flow, because we can't fully kind of keep materials in play unless we really understand deeply, um, you know, the ingredients, the volumes of materials flowing through supply chains. And so we see that as an enabling factor. So when you say that you, um, you said, I think at Closed Loop Partners, you're working to incentivize these circular systems instead of the linear symptoms, uh, systems. Are there things that Pantella and Emily and their design teams can be doing to help facilitate that and, you know, to help incentivize that, um, what would you say to these design teams, to them and to everybody else listening to help incentivize that? Yeah, I think, you know, what's interesting about design is that design can move so much more quickly than infrastructure can. And so often what you find is that the design of products outpaces the ability for infrastructure to keep up. Um, we're seeing that in massive ways on compostability, right? Like uh, people are making version uh, compostable products of a bunch of different things when the infrastructure is so ill-equipped to process these new kinds of materials. I would say to designers to incentivize both the collections, processing and remanufacturing of materials is to really, um, think about the ingredients, formulations, um, and uh, disassembly of the products that they're producing because um, for every stakeholder in the manu remanufacturing or recycling side of things, every minute spent kind of disassembling, um, every kind of additional step that's required to reprocess a material is a cost. Um, and a lot of these recycling, composting, remanufacturing um, businesses are running like pretty tight margin businesses. And so we have to really be thinking about 
um, you know, even the economics of the entire value chain. If someone, and there's a policy angle to this, of course, you know, there's a lot of incentives that you can place from a policy perspective, but um, maybe that would be like a starting point, I think, to designers is really thinking about um, downstream operations and what you can do from a design perspective to really support their unit economics um, and, uh, and their end markets and how your product aligns to their end markets. And for our audience to be clear, when we talk about design for disassembly, um, that's a catchphrase that's often used in the product design world <clears throat> to talk about um, a, an approach to designing something so that it can be fully disassembled. So you would be using mechanical fasteners instead of glue, for instance. Um, certain types of fittings allow things to be removed, whereas others don't. Cold connections over um, hot connections, that type of thing. And that's all in the name of prioritizing repair, um, as Pantilla was mentioning, and, and Emily with both of your products, but also um, so that you can later reclaim um, technical nutrients, meaning all of the parts of your product that can be recycled later, or biological nutrients, meaning all of the parts of your product that can be composted later. So just to clarify that for anybody who's maybe new to this world, um, Pantella and Emily, you're both nodding. Is what Paula's saying resonating for you? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I know you mentioned kind of the points of connection, and I know that we've worked on that a lot, Sarah, for our products, but just in terms of, you know, designing for disassembly, we like not using glue in the upholstery process so that those materials can eventually come apart. Um, and so thinking about that, like we've been talking about from the onset so that you can kind of do that. Um, and I think it goes to the disassembly. It also goes to the resale. So for example, we have a, um, a program that we call Survive Revive, where we guarantee our customers that we'll take those products back and facilitate a resale. To essentially, you know, this is pre-disassembly, but to extend that lifespan even more if a customer, you know, being in New York, we see furniture on the curb all the time. And so um, tons of furniture waste goes to landfills. It's a huge way um, that the furniture industry has an impact on the environment and um, avoiding that. And I think it very much is an industry problem that multiple players will have to help tackle because there is so much that goes into addressing whether that's the resale side, but then also the take back side, the disassembly side, and then the recycling side. But um, yeah, it's, it's exciting to see it as people focusing on this. So hopefully we'll see you know, partners that pop up in those different parts of the chain to help us create this solution. Yeah, and the piece that really resonates with me in addition to everything Fantilla said was when Paula's talking about incentivizing the supply chain and creating new supply chains, the work that Closed Loop Partners does to bring partners together, I think is so important because circularity is about a system. And so Fantilla and myself can do all sorts of wonderful things in our own organizations, but we're still living within a system and there's a need to really bring partners together. And I know that's another thing that Closed Loop Partners does is bring people together and and brings industry together to really solve difficult challenges. And so to truly bring about circularity and to truly design for circularity, there's a lot of things that the industry needs to do in a pre-competitive space together in order to figure things out so that the whole system will work downstream. Yeah, so Closed Loop Partners is a potential resource for all of you out there listening and wondering where to get started with all of this. Um, Pantella, you've mentioned in passing a couple of times so far this um, audit that you and I worked on together. Can you go a little bit more into detail about what that experience was like, what, what the goals were for that, what that entailed, and um, what it sort of told you? Because I think for a lot of people who are wondering where to get started, um, to me, I always advocate like, well, look at what you have right now. Let's look at what's working and what's not working and figure out solutions to the other parts. So I wonder um, if you could sort of use your experience as a case study to kind of walk people through what that entailed and what it looked like. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Sarah and I worked on kind of an audit of our products to understand, you know, where we can incorporate even more sustainable materials. So, you know, as one of the goals was, um, making a higher percentage of our material content, either recycled, upcycled, um, 
or natural. And so going through all these different materials, we made the switch out in terms of utilizing burlap and glute. Um, we used mechanical fasteners in the upholstery process. Then also just thinking, I think another thing that, you know, you really taught me was also thinking about not only making switches, but just eliminating anything that wasn't necessary. And so sometimes the materials that you use aren't entirely necessary. And so thinking critically about everything that goes into your products and whether it's adding something to the actual, you know, use of the product. Um, and even if it's something that, you know, may be done in the industry or has been done in the industry that you might not need to do. Um, but yes, I definitely, I learned a ton. And I think what was, what I learned is, I mean, we implemented those changes that we made, but it's also a continuous process is what I learned is that, you know, there are the materials and the options available to you at that point when you conduct, conduct that analysis. And that's amazing. And maybe you can implement them, a portion of them at that time. Maybe some of them you have to reserve for later because more product development needs to be done. But at the same time, I think what's exciting is that um, a lot of innovation is happening in the industry on the material side. And so new things and new options are coming up all the time. And so it has to kind of be a continuous conversation and a continuous exploration to see the options out there. And what I find exciting also is that, you know, we have a lot of inbound in, uh, interest from different suppliers doing really great things and interesting things in the material space. And so working directly with those suppliers to develop materials that might not be used in the furniture industry currently, maybe used in other industries that aren't um, you know, entirely compatible yet, but with some tweaks can get there. And so um, I think in the spirit of constantly innovating and working on that, um, that's been an exciting area as well. Yeah, I, I find it really helpful to look at any product and just think about like, what materials and what processes go into making this? What of those is compatible with circularity or um, helps work towards circularity and which of these is really preventing it? And then the stuff that's good, let's, that's great. Even if it was just coincidentally there, let's keep it. And then all the other stuff you can sort of start with a low hanging fruit <laughs> and address that, the easy things right away. And then it's kind of an evolving process to get to the other things. But, um, but I do think that probably many people are sitting here um, listening to us and wondering like where, how on earth am I supposed to begin this process in my company that I like, where I maybe feel like I'm just a cog in this big wheel or I started a company and now I want it to be um, uh, work towards circularity, but I have no idea where to begin. It, it can be quite an overwhelming um, process and topic to take on, particularly because there's so much related to sustainability that is greenwashing, that is not quantifiable. I think circularity is a great place to start because it is a much more concrete concept. Um, and so in the remaining few minutes that we have, I would love to hear all of you just give your advice on where people can get started. And to start it off, I will quickly plug that um, Mebel and the Sustainable Furnishings Council have um, launched a really useful glossary of terms and concepts um, that are common in circularity, specifically circularity for the furnishings industry, um, along with case studies that represent each of these things, uh, each of these ideas. So um, I think we're going to put a link to um, where you can access that or how you can access that in the chat box. And included in it is examples of um, how Ruben Board uses urban wood and how Sabai has uh, designed their products for repair, to prioritize repair. So um, we've got really nice examples from our moderators. Um, so yes, I will, I'll turn it back to you in the remaining few minutes that we have. Yeah, and just, just to plug, um, in term for Mevel's um, glossary of terms, those will also, we're actually having a pop-up for anyone who is in New York in Nolita for the month of May. We're having an open house this Saturday evening. I'll share the event, but the glossary of terms will also be on display there. But 
yes, I would definitely say a lot of resources um, such as this glossary are becoming available for people to kind of have, you know, vocabulary around how to tackle this. And then also if you look at, you know, dif different um, guides around life cycle assessment, it kind of gives you a way to frame each part of the life cycle and how to think about it. And so um, I'd say, you know, just start thinking about that concept, learning about it and thinking about the impact of your, your products at each and every stage. And I would just build on that. It, it is a marathon. And so you kind of have to celebrate every mile. And if you, if you get to the 5k point, like celebrate that. And so I think starting to talk with your partners and share your interest, because I think Fentilla mentioned, you know, you talk with partners and they have all these great ideas that they're thinking of. And so when you talk with your partners and start sharing your interest, people start to generate ideas and things that they may already have and circularity the pieces of circularity, you know, takes a lot of different shapes. And so, you know, if look at what steps you can take, whether that's making sure all of your packaging is recyclable, looking at zero waste in manufacturing, allowing ways to have product donation or product reuse or using the reclaimed materials. Each one of those are kind of a point in the marathon. And so it can be, you don't have to necessarily tackle everything on Monday, <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be a journey. And so just start tackling something. And then when you have that tackled, then tackle the next thing. And so I think just um, celebrating each mile marker and, and not be daunted by the, the full marathon. And, and I'll quickly say, um, I completely agree. It is a marathon and circularity is in its infancy from a, a uh, a sector standpoint. We're definitely building the plane as we're flying it. Um, and so just building off of what Emily said, you know, just taking note of where people's skill sets and passions within your design and um, broader company are and taking inventory of that to understand, okay, as a starting point, you know, looking at the materials within our products and how can we source or select different kinds of materials um, or experiment with marketing to customers to kind of better understand the opportunities um, to educate because like there's so much um, there's so much opportunity I think with different customer decisions whether it's you know making sure that they put that packaging in the right bin or making planting a seed of an idea that they maybe think about donating the furniture or um, you know, putting it up on a Craigslist or some similar type of site at the end of use or giving it back to you if that's um, long term possible. So, uh, yeah, it, that, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think that raises a really good point of um, thinking in the design stages about how you can influence the consumer's behavior because you we can do everything possible, but um, with the product itself and with the systems and all these other things. But um, if the consumer isn't incentivized to do something with this, then um, that kind of ruins our best laid plan. So thinking about how you can use design and policy and other things to sort of um, incentivize it or educate or influence the consumer. Um, communicate with them in all these different ways is a really big part of it. Um, we have so many questions from our um, viewers. And so I'm just going to start with this one. Um, so uh, Mastak in London asks, what role do you see repair playing in the future of furniture? I think repair has a big role within furniture and I think it's already, we're already using it. Um, so I know at Room and Board, all of our delivery centers have people on staff that can repair furniture, whether it's coming off of a truck and maybe had some, had some um, damage that can be repaired easily, or if it's already gone to a customer's home, but then something happened and someone is going out to repair. So I don't think repair is as widely known about or utilized and or asked for but I think that the the ability to repair is available um I think where it gets really difficult is upholstery upholstery can be very difficult to repair some other things can be easier but I think it plays a huge role um in the durability and the longevity and the just the lifetime of that initial product 
Completely. I would definitely agree. Um, I think, I mean, I've mentioned previously, but we also have a repair program that, um, you know, a lot of it, like Sarah mentioned, is around education. And so I think as we've started promoting that program, whether it's for repair reasons or for, you know, changing out different colors or styles, um, we have seen customers be really excited about that and participate in that program. And so um, I think there's a lot of potential there. I think on the business side, um, you know, I think that some, a lot of the time people, well, a lot of the time sustainability and um, whether it's profitability or thinking about the business can kind of be a struggle and how to balance those two. But I think it can actually be something that benefits both in terms of like offering programs like this that benefit both the customer, but um, can benefit the business as well. Maybe it's something that, you know, you're selling extra inserts, or you're selling extra parts um, as well. I think in terms of the customer side, that's an area that we have been really excited about in terms of just the response that we've seen, whether it's on the repair side, the resale side, even just the materials, people are becoming more and more educated around what to look for. And so we get a lot of really detailed questions about our materials, which is, is great to see, honestly, because it shows that the customer is getting more educated and cares about this. And so I think in thinking about the customer side, I think that's a really we're seeing a lot of exciting signals from that area as well. Yeah, and it, it's also interesting, right? I think we've probably, many of us here have had the experience where you needed to get your water heater repaired or your, um, I don't know, your refrigerator repaired or something. And they say like, well, we can't repair this. We can't replace this one tiny part. You have to buy these 40 parts that are only come together in this one giant chunk and it's very expensive. And almost seems to be encouraging us to just buy a new refrigerator instead. But now we are seeing a wave of companies um, going back on that and offering like, well, you can just get a new arm for your couch. You don't need to buy the whole new couch. And even quite a lot of laws being implemented in various places, um, encouraging or discouraging that or making that even illegal, particularly with um, not so much in furniture, but particularly in electronics. But I think we'll see that really having a trickle effect to other areas as well. Um, <clears throat> so we also have a question of um, from Laura in Baltimore. Can, how can resources for creating sustainability or many live furniture be put into the hands of smaller scale firms and craftspeople? Well, I think that we can uh, point out, for instance, that the Sustainable Furnishings Council is a wonderful resource for anybody um, at any level of the furnishings industry, um, the professional organization that one can join at various levels with lots of interesting resources um, related to um, policy, specific techniques that we can individually enact, lots of um, resource meeting groups that happen on a monthly basis to really workshop specific issues that you're having. So you may all wanna go check out Sustainable Furnishings Council. Um, Mebel, of course, as we just discussed, has lots of resources as well, exhibitions, glossaries. Um, but I think you, um, each of our panelists probably have some specific examples from your worlds that you would recommend implementing as well. I think it was mentioned earlier, but you know, I, I think the world of the cradle to cradle certification and just making sure, or uh, that's one potential resource to kind of identify um, places to source different materials across the design of the product. I think the, the partnerships within your own supply chain or partnerships across peers. I know I have a lot of calls and conversations with people that are peers within the industry, and there's just a lot of exchanging of ideas. And that type, that can, type of conversation can happen one-on-one. -on -one. It can also happen within the working groups of the Sustainable Furnishings Council. But I think just being able to learn from each other, I find that people in the sustainability space are just a lot of really good humans <laughs> and we're all working towards the the greater good for people and planet and and we all tend to share our time and our knowledge as well which is which has helped me a ton in my career and i always like to pay that forward as well 
Uh, definitely. I would also say this is, I guess, not so much a resource, but I think one thing that one question I've gotten in the past, just as a younger company has been, you know, I think, yes, sourcing materials that are certif certified is really great. And then about certifying your own materials um, or your own products that can be an expensive process. And so for smaller scale manufacturers or retailers or um, whoever or craftspeople, um, you know, if you aren't at a stage where you can afford to get your own product or your company certified, we found that, um, and there are also just so many different certifications and they speak to so many different things that um, customers can be just as responsive or, you know, resonate with your product just as much through um, just storytelling and communicating. If you're just communicating with people about, you know, where your materials are coming from, what they are, even if they aren't, even if your entire product isn't certified, um, because you might not have the resources for that, that, um, that can be just as impactful um, for customers as well. I think that there are also just a lot of really super simple techniques um, that, you know, small companies and craftspeople can be implementing. Um, I mean, we talked about going ahead and doing an audit on your own product line. That's something that an individual can do. That's also something that Ikea recently did over with over 10,000 um, objects. So companies and um, firms of all sizes are finding that to be a valuable tool. Um, I've also heard through meetings at Sustainable Furnishings Council, um, companies talking about how their clients are putting pressure on them to make sure that they are um, using circularity and sustainable materials, which is exciting, but it's also a reminder for us as designers and business leaders that we can put pressure on people too. ask, you know, ask our suppliers to really break down for us where this material is coming from, exactly what the contents are. And that's part of, I think, you know, a little bit what Emily's saying, like fostering relationships with your, um, suppliers and partners and, and, in um, the product line and supply chain um, and communicating with them how important it is that um, you want to be using these materials and these processes and systems as well. Um, there's also just a ton of resources out there about designing for disassembly and how to ensure that your um, products can, the, the components of your products can be reclaimed as technical and biological nutrients. So if you do a quick Google search for any of those terms, I think you'll find some techniques available too that are not hard. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Ellen says, how do you build anything these days without the use of plastic? So good question, Ellen. But I think a side question is, um, what are your feelings about using plastic? Is there a time and a place where it's appropriate? How do you use it ethically? You know, we do need to, um, there, there are times when it's just not appropriate to make something out of glass, for instance. I'm thinking of a little bit more of the medical industry, maybe than the furniture industry, but um, do you all have policies about plastics and, and using plastic in your, um, your products? I think it's not only a product question, but it's also a packaging question, um, just to be able to protect um, the furniture as it goes to the supply chain, because if something gets damaged, if a, if a product is damaged throughout the, through mm -hmm. transit, you know, then we have, then we have an even bigger problem on our hands. And so at Room and Board, we're trying our best to use less and less plastic. And then where we do need to use plastic, we're making sure that we're able to recycle all of that. And so that's not a perfect solution, but it's kind of um, doing the best we can right now and then continually looking for more non-plastic solutions. Definitely, I think, um... Eliminating plastic is a huge priority for us. Um, I mean, our, our products, since they are flat packed and assemblable, we can ship them with um, in you know cardboard boxes. And so those pieces are packed um, without the use of any plastic, which has been great. But um, you know, in the product itself, I think where you can utilize recycled plastic as much as possible. And then also thinking about like we've been discussing how that could potentially be recycled as well. And so 
Um, you know, we use recycled fiber for our products. We're talking right now, working with a supplier to come up with a solution where, you know, if those materials are taken back, they can be refiltered or put back into that supply chain and recycled again. And so um, I think there is a, a place for plastic sometimes, um, especially if you can kind of close that loop and continue utilizing them because they can be recycled um, without deteriorating as much. Um, and then also from a, an accessibility standpoint, I think that can be particularly useful for us because we are trying to make sustainable living accessible. We are, you know, targeting a more affordable price point and um, plastic can be more affordable. And so recycle, utilizing recycled plastic in those cases can offer kind of a in-between solution in terms of, you know, still being recycled, still um, designing for a closed loop system, but also being accessible from a price point standpoint. This is a question specifically for Paula. And Paula, you might also have comments about plastic, but I'll let you answer that first and then move on to this other one. Have you experienced any pressure to achieve certain ESG outcomes based on design? Oh, it's a good one. So um, not directly since, since we are an investment firm with a research, research arm, but I think many of our um, investors, which are Fortune 100 companies and uh, many of the innovators, uh, so small startup businesses with innovative materials or um, services um, likely do. I mean, that's certainly... Um, a little bit out of the scope of, of this particular conversation, but you know, at the macro level, uh, sustainable finance is going through you know close scrutiny in terms of like how do you measure uh, the true impact of these ESG funds and financial products that are going out into the system, and so uh, as a firm, we are constantly evaluating. Um, you know, the tons diverted for a particular investment. Um, the, the per perceived and actualized impact of, you know, a certain investment into a company and, and helping them achieve a specific scale over, you know, a three to five year time horizon. Um, so it's something that we think about every day. I think um, the opportunities as it relates to connecting sustainable investment to ESG impact measurement is, you um, in its early stages as well. And where I see the most activity is trying to build direct linkages and new language around um, sort of like uh, climate change and circularity, right? Like I think there's a whole new language and a whole set of metrics that don't yet quite exist, but we're in part of active conversations around um, measuring circularity because there's a time bound element to it. There's also a quality element to it. You know, one recycling process might reset plastic to a virgin-like um, uh, quality that can have mass application, while another recycling product can downgrade um, plastic materials. And, and a lot of the furniture that utilizes plastic materials or recycled plastics is, is an example of downgrading plastic materials. And um, I guess that my only comment on like the plastic question is, you know, reduction is so critical across any material or reduction strategies and implementing those first, I think are, is the first step in any kind of design process. As it relates to plastic, um, you know, what concerns me most about plastic is actually the additives to that polymer. So plastic is, and it, taking you back to maybe high school chemistry is, is like a homopolymer, like a polypropylene or a polyethylene. And then we add a bunch of stuff to it that also comes from the petrochemical company. Um, those would be plasticizers, dyes, mm -hmm. different kinds of things for it to fit a specific function um, in the product that it's going to. The homopolymer itself, and there's a lot of research around this, um, is, is not... It is probably the less kind of dangerous portion of that whole product. It's the additives and the stuff that we add to the homopolymer that makes it potentially problematic as it's going through a supply chain in perpetuity. There's human health impacts related to that. 
I think um, plastic is a ubiquitous material and there are certain industries, maybe healthcare, where plastics is here to stay. Um, the question and, and opportunity I think ahead of us is figuring out how do we keep all of the plastic that we've already extracted from the ground in constant circulation in, in, in the supply chain so that we can reduce our extractive activities because that's really, um, that's the biggest impact to our environment is, is how we're constantly going back to tap. Uh, earth for new fossil fuels, um, when there's a lot of it above the ground already. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll have to leave it there. We have so many good questions still to answer and lots of interesting resources that have been put in the chat box, but fortunately we're out of time. So I'm going to turn it over to Mona. Um, thank you and just it, quickly say thank you to all of our panelists, to Mebel Transforming Futures and to the Sustainable Furnishings Council for providing this opportunity today. Thank you. Thanks to Sarah and again to the speakers for this inspiring and very practical conversation. Um, and thank you to our festival hosts at Circular City Week. Uh, we've put a set of uh, links in the chat uh, and I just wanted to share a few announcements. Mebel and the Sustainable Furnishings Council are excited to be releasing the circular glossary for furniture and furnishings, which has been mentioned already, and you saw a sneak peek of. Um, so that's coming in the coming out in the coming weeks. So you'll um, see a link in the chat uh, to sign up um, to be notified when it's ready. And then we have two glossary related events coming up an in-person open house next week on May 10th as part of NYC by Design. And that is going to be in Sabai's pop-up space where you'll get to see their circularity in practice. And we have an online workshop with Sustainable Furnishings Council on June 16th as well, related to the glossary. We hope you're enjoying our events in the Circularity in Furniture series at Circular City Week. This week isn't over. See the link in the chat for more events organized by our peers, including one by Christina Cobb Urbisico um, tomorrow. We'd really appreciate it if you take one to two minutes to fill out the feedback form linked in the chat so we can continue to improve our programming. And we'll share the recording, chat log, and resource lists in the coming days. And we look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks.